Well, greetings and salutations, everyone, and welcome to today's bonus. Before we jump into it, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It does not cost a cent. Click that like button. It takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon. And folks, please leave a comment and share the video. Why? Well, because all of these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. They are 100% appreciated and they do matter. Now everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to today's bonus, shall we? Today's first subscriber submission. Hey Jeff, you can call me Teddy because I am not going to share my real name. I live close to a place called Old Fort, North Carolina. There's a road in Old Fort called Curtis Creek Road that leads all the way up to the Blue Ridge Parkway. It's a nice curvy road all the way up. And it's a dirt road. The Nightmare, my real life dog man encounter. My wife and I had just gotten married back in July of 2017, and we had been staying here for about two months in an apartment, so she and I decided to go somewhere. I had taken her to Curtis Creek. Sure, I've been up there before, but I did not go all the way up to the Blue Ridge Parkway. I was planning to scare my wife half to death. Well, I guess I bit off more than I could chew. I got halfway past the campground that's up there, about a mile up, and I stopped because I had to relieve myself. When I did, I turned off the car and I turned off the lights, thinking that I should be safe up here. Oh boy, I was wrong because when I went to go relieve myself, I was standing right beside a tree. Then I smelled this god-awful, wet dog, iron-like smell. I thought it was a pack of coyotes close by, so I didn't pay too much attention to it. Just to let you know, I was basically in the middle of the woods, and it was dark, two in the morning dark. I finished my business, and I was about seven feet away from my car. I went back to my car, I opened the door of my 92 Toyota Corolla, and that's when I heard it. A blood-chilling growl. I quickly jumped back into the car and turned on the high beams. Then I saw it just feet from where I had been. Where the tree was and where I had been standing, it had been right behind me, I was thinking to myself. I then started freaking out about what I had seen. It had pointed ears, darkish brown fur with hints of white. And the things that I will never forget are the blood-stained teeth and the bright yellow eyes glaring at me. At first, to me, it looked like a giant wolf because it was five feet tall on all fours. It growled some more, then stood up on its hind legs to where now it looked to be eight feet, and I could see its legs. My wife said, what is that? About the same time I did. I put the car into gear and floored it backwards until I could find a place to completely turn around and pull forward. I about ran us off the road trying to get out of there. Then we got about halfway down where the campground was. The howling began, and once I hit the paved road, I floored it because we couldn't go that fast around the curves on the dirt road. We have not been back up there after dark since. If you do go explore... Don't go after dark or close to nightfall because you will regret it. Today's second North Carolina subscriber submission. Hey Jeff, I'm just going to get right to the point. It was March 6th, 2.42 a.m. I woke up to use the restroom. I heard something outside of my bedroom window, like something was scuffling around. I didn't pay it any mind. After I got back into bed, I heard these 
Five hard knocks on the outside of my bedroom wall. I was frozen in fear. I laid there. Then there was a scent that came wafting through my window. I like to sleep with my window about a quarter of the way up. The odor was the smell of roadkill. It smelled so awful to the point that I wanted to throw up. I did not look out of the window, but I got the nerve to check on the doors, my grandbaby, and my daughter. After I got back into bed, I just lied there to see if I could hear anything messing around the house. It was all quiet. I felt as if something was lingering around my window. I have my bed, the head of my bed, next to the window. After 30 minutes, it growled. It was not a loud one, but a strong enough to get my attention. Knowing that this dog man was inches away from the top of my head freaked me out, and it still does. Jeff, this was at my home. There's no coming back from this. When I mentioned in one of my comments to you that I was getting comfortable again, I was. I had started again with my nightly rides when I had mentioned Elizabethtown, which was nice, you know, searching. Didn't see anything. I went out last night. I just wanted to go and get out and get some fresh air from being cooped up from the virus. This time I drove to Cedar Creek, a little town outside of Fayetteville, March 17th, 2020. It was between 11 and 1 in the morning. I was... It was going to be an uneventful ride, or so I thought. I had to use the restroom, so I turned off the main road to a side street to find a secluded area. As I was driving along, I saw lights from the house and a lot of cars, so I turned around and headed back to the main road. I couldn't hold it anymore, so I pulled over to the side and peed. I left my driver's side door open just in case I had to jump back into the car quickly. I turned my hazards on and I went to the back of the car. As I was handling my business, I saw these amber orangish eyes looking straight at me. They were down to my level. I didn't see them until I was in the squatted position. They were swaying back and forth like it was moving with each step. I froze. I wasn't scared. I just couldn't move. The eyes were huge. I'd say about a foot across from each other. I couldn't see anything but the eyes. Like everything around it was black. The creature was 30 to 40 yards from me. I'm picturing a football field, and I'd say it was that distance. Close to a minute at this moment, time was no factor. Those eyes just spellbound me. What brought me back to myself, there were headlights coming from my right side. It's left side, you can see. I jumped up, got myself together, and when I looked back at the eyes, they were gone. I believe the car's headlights may have spooked it. These things don't really spook. I know it hid. There's no smell, no sound. It was like time had stopped. I know for a fact that if that car had not come, I would not be here right now. Maybe it was holding my attention as I was fixing to get bum-rushed from all sides. I don't know. I just know I never ever forget those eyes or the way they moved. Something strange happened when the car came up behind me. I was already back in my car. They flashed their lights at me and drove very slowly past me and slowly down the road. When I pulled back onto the road, they picked up speed again. I don't know if they saw the dog man as well and just made sure I was okay. I wasn't out looking for them last night. With my first encounter, I just told you about. The next, I was at the kitchen sink. I looked out the kitchen window and saw this guy looking at the side of the house where the knocks had happened that night. He was parked in a red truck on the road behind our house. I haven't seen the man since, or maybe he comes when I'm not at home or by chance looking. I smelt it, heard it, saw its eyes. Maybe my next encounter I'll see the whole creature. Not rushing it, but I feel that it's going to happen. I'm not going to dwell. Thank you for being here. That's an interesting fact, um, or thought, fact, thought, I think fact, some people may think thought, but we've heard how they are very tactical and how they like to bum rush things. And I'm not trying to say that this is how something went down because I wasn't there and no one else was, but 
what if this woman, the predicament that she was just in, what if Dr. Nancy Shaw, the doctor who was mauled to death on the side of the road, had to use the restroom and she couldn't hold it? If you think about the way this lady just described the whole scenario, <clears throat> she had pulled over on a side road, left her door open, and proceeded to do her business. Well, how they found Dr. Nancy Shaw was her car was pulled over to a road on the side of the road, door wide open, and she was found on the other side of the road in a ditch torn apart. Hmm. Makes you wonder. I mean, when I first heard about the case, I immediately, I think it was like a day after, I immediately thought like maybe that they had kind of, one had laid out in the ground in front of her car and she got out to see if it was okay. And realizing when it was too late that it was not a dog or, you know, a canine, but a dog man instead. This actually makes a little more sense. Like maybe it was a, it was a, an attack of an opportunist attack on Dr. Nancy Shaw. This is why I like going over, and I've said it a couple different times, I love going over old subscriber encounters. Um, this is the first time I've done it, but I'm starting to get patterns here. All right, moving on. Today's third North Carolina subscriber submission. Hey Jeff, my name's Mark, I'm 47 and I live in Cleveland County, North Carolina. When I was younger, somewhere between 8 and 11, maybe 12, I don't really know for sure. Anyway, I was spending the night at my cousin's house, who is two years older than me, and a girl. Another one of our cousins was also spending the night as well. She was the eldest of us three. She was three years older than I. They were, and still are, my favorite cousins. They were both tomboys at the time, and Lynn, the older cousin, was a ball player and a little bit more athletic than me or Amy. They were both a head taller than me, as I had not grown hardly. We were walking through the pine forest that had been replanted after it had been cleared out years earlier. We came across a leg in the woods, a large calf's leg, and it was fresh, as if the blood was still wet. It looked like it had been just ripped off. You could see the tendons and everything. Amy said that some of her relatives had some cows on the family land well over a hundred acres that her grandparents had homesteaded. Her grandfather, full Cherokee, and grandmother, half German and half Cherokee. Anyway, we weren't really freaked out by the leg, and God knows why, I don't. So we kept walking deeper into the woods, just exploring. We eventually came to a large field, maybe 300 yards across, with sporadic pine trees that were probably 10 feet tall, maybe a little less. When we see something that's medium to dark brown just standing directly in the middle of the field. It looked like it was on all fours and it looked kind of fat. Lynn yelled that it was a bear. Well, it heard her and turned around. It was not on all fours and it was not fat. When it turned around, it dropped the calf and it was looking towards us. We didn't get a look at whether it had a snout or a flat face because we were hauling butt. Turns out Lynn wasn't faster, nor was Amy. I was hauling. So much so, I got clipped by a limb and fell, got right back up and made it out of the woods first. We told my mom and Amy's mom, and they told our dads when they had gotten back from a side job. Me and Amy took them to where we saw the calf leg. It was still there, but they couldn't make out any tracks because the ground was hard and covered with pine needles. Lynn did not go back in the woods because she had called her mom and dad to get her. So we showed them the field where we saw whatever we saw, and we found the tree that it was standing near. They found blood and trampled weeds. Now, we didn't go into the woods unarmed. My dad had a 7mm rifle and a 44 Magnum revolver. Amy's dad had a 30 6 
Now, my uncle is a tall guy, around 6'4", and he stood next to that tree. That whatever that creature was at, and me and Amy went back to standing where we were. And my uncle looked small beside that tree, but that creature did not. We went back to the house and headed home later. The next couple of days brought more incidents. Something tapped on Amy's window one night and a track was found and it was big, so I was told. Something left a muddy mark on the side of Amy's grandparents' home, way up high, and more tracks were found. As time went on, more people saw something, and it was given the name Nobby because of the mountain it was seen. It's called Ben's Knob. Well, there you go, 100% true, as a matter of fact. Amy was my mom's yesterday, and we were talking about this like it was burned into our minds. My wife believes we saw what we saw. Have a good day. Today's fourth North Carolina subscriber submission, but second, Cleveland County subscriber submission. Hey Jeff, when I was a little girl, my grandfather lived in an old farmhouse in the upper end of Cleveland County, North Carolina. We used to go visit him every Saturday, my dad, my mom, my baby brother and I, along with several of my dad's brothers, sisters, an assortment of children. We would congregate after lunch at my granddad's. Us cousins would play together outside and out in the woods, which ran behind my grandfather's farm and stretched probably 10 miles to a dirt road, beyond which was an apple orchard and a cattle pasture. This was the early 80s in a rural area, back when kids could take off to the woods for hours and it was okay. We would all have dinner together, hang out until bedtime for the kids, when we would all head home. At the time, I had just turned eight. My cousin Jay was six. My brother and Jay's sister were both small toddlers, barely walking. The night in question, Jay and I and our siblings were the only kids present. He and I had spent the day playing out in the woods as usual and out in the yard where Jay was trying out his prized possession, his brand new skateboard. After supper, we hung out in the back bedroom watching TV until our parents informed us that it was time to go home. My grandfather's house has a glassed-in porch which serves as a laundry room on the front, right outside of the kitchen. This porch, because of the way the lot was laid out, the house was built, was fairly tall. Looking out the windows gave you a panoramic and slightly elevated view of the backyard. I would speculate that the porch were about 20 feet off the ground, and the backyard sloped away from the porch. The backyard was lit by two large lights, one which was mounted on a pole to the left of the yard, the other mounted on the side of my grandfather's shop, which was to the right. They were very bright, and each light lit up a fair, fairly large area. The only really shadowy part of the backyard was the area where the large tree stood, casting a shadow that fell between the shop and the greenhouse, which was too far left of the yard. It was under this tree that Jay had left his skateboard, and we stopped playing to eat supper. He and I decided we should go get it while our parents were saying their farewells in the kitchen. The dog man was in the backyard. We saw him at the same time as soon as we entered the porch. He was man-sized, and he looked exactly like a werewolf from a bad B movie. He had shaggy, dark brown wolfman head with long pointed ears and a lighter brown muzzle. His hands were human-like as best I can remember, though they were covered in dark fur and had long claws. But he was wearing a red and black checkered flannel shirt and blue jeans. I don't remember anything about his feet, whether he had shoes or claws, but his legs were straight like a person's, not bent backwards like a dog. He was walking back and forth in the yard, almost robot-like or as if it was on a track. I can't really describe it well. It was like his legs were moving a little, but not enough to actually count as walking. It was more like he was gliding, but in a jerky way. His body was human in proportion. He would move from the edge to the light near the greenhouse, across to the light near the shop. Stopping when he reached the end of the illuminated area and turning around in that strange, jerky way, gliding. 
His eyes were red and glowed some, like one of those laser lights you use to tease your cat. That color and about that level of brightness. The only time he was out of our sight was when he passed into the shadowed area of the tree. He seemed like he was showing off for us, wanting us to see him, or at least that's what it felt like. The feeling that he carried with him was overwhelming malevolence. I felt like he knew we were there and he could see us watching. And feel that we were afraid and he was glad. Not sure if that makes sense, but it was what I felt at the time, dread and fear and like he was aware of us in doing what he was doing on purpose to scare us. Of course, we freaked out and started screaming for our parents, and of course, they came rushing out onto the porch only to hear us hysterically screaming because of the wolf man in the backyard. They said the usual parent thing about overactive imagination and too much Scooby-Doo. Because even though he was there walking back and forth right in front of them, we could only see him, not the adults. I remember pointing and saying, he's out there, and being really frustrated because they couldn't see it. Finally, my dad, determined to put an end to the nonsense, announced that he was going into the yard and get Jay's skateboard from under the tree. We tried to stop him, but he went anyway. At that point, the wolf man was still doing his strange, gliding walk back and forth when my dad opened the porch door and hit the steps that led from the porch to the yard. He triggered the motion sensor light, which was on the corner of the porch awning, lighting up the shadowed tree area. Just before this happened, the wolf man had stepped into the shadowed area and disappeared from view in the dark when the light came on. Lightening up the tree area, the wolf man was just gone. It was as if he had vanished into thin air, as they say. We never saw him again, though we became mildly obsessed with werewolves for a while after that and started hoarding silver in case we needed to make silver bullets. When you are a child, it's pretty amazing what you can consider normal. We were scared at that time it happened, but it's like afterwards it didn't feel completely real because it was so bizarre and we sort of made a game out of it. A few weird things happened to us in the woods after that, but nothing that could be considered paranormal beyond doubt, and nothing like us seeing the wolf man. Years had passed, but I always wondered about what we saw that night. My cousin Jay forgot about it all together. I asked him about it a few months ago, and he didn't remember at all. What really brought it back to my memory was the story in Linda Godfrey's Real Werewolf, about a girl who saw the hitchhiking werewolf wearing clothes. Before that, I had never seen a serious report of a canine or lupin humanoid wearing clothes in any publication. I don't often tell anybody about my werewolf that we saw because it sounds so completely crazy. Of course, my parents and Jay's parents never for one second believed we saw anything. I don't fully know the history of the land around my grandfather's. I know there were a lot of Katawaba Indians in that area before colonial times, and that there were several strange formations in the part of the county that people claim to be native mounds, though none of them seem to be officially recognized as such. There have been several Bigfoot flaps in this county as well, and there are Black Panthers here. I have seen both black and tan, as my father and many hunters he knows, though they are not, in my opinion, anything supernatural, just regular animals. I have no idea to this day what it was that we saw in that backyard. I find it hard to believe that it was actually a werewolf, but it feels like it was something paranormal. Seeing it caused me to have a lifelong interest in cryptozoology and the 14 phenomenon. I've thought a lot about it, and I sort of feel like John Keel was right when he suggested that there are something out there that messes with us. Something because it can. Like maybe something wanted to be scary and knew that the stereotypical werewolf would frighten us little kids. I even wondered if it could have been someone dressed in a costume playing a prank, but that wouldn't explain the weird gliding, unnatural way it moved or the way it was able to disappear so fast, or the fact that apparently five adults couldn't even see it, but us two kids could. Just 
thought this may interest you because of the novelty. It sounds so out there and frankly made up that I doubt anyone would believe it anyway. I have told maybe four people my entire life about it, including my ex-husband who did not believe me. I have never mentioned it to my current husband because it's just so weird. I would, however, be interested to know if anyone else out there has experienced anything similar, either a werewolf-type form dressed in clothing or something that they felt was something pretending to be something that it was not. For whatever reason, I feel strongly that this was happening. I appreciate you taking the time to read this and have really enjoyed your work. Good luck with your research. This is another reason why I enjoy doing this. Um, because when I narrated this a while ago, I kind of just skimmed. And it not really skimmed, but I thought, well, hey, you know, there have been a couple of different encounters with dogmen that have been wearing clothes. The Ohio encounter, the one that she talked about in uh, Linda Godfrey's book. There's two right there. Now, there's three that we've heard. A couple of different, not a lot, but a couple of different other ones. But now that I'm redoing this and for some reason getting a second crack at it, I guess. Instantly, what popped into my head was a upload that I did about a year and a half to two years ago about inorganic beings. And I talked about inorganic beings um, as what people perceive as the, and I hate this name, rake, but as the creature that people see as the rake. Um, not the creepy pasta stories because they are all creepy pasta stories. There is no mention of them anywhere in historic events, only in the creepy pasta history. Okay. Um, pe then people will, of course, say, "Well, they're ghouls and this and that." Well, yeah, that's a cool name for them, but the rake is the history of this creature as the rake is is a is a fictitious story. It was written by someone. Um. There are these creatures that have been seen throughout history, but they're not called the rake. That's just a cool name for them, which I don't know why a hand tool is cool. Um, <laughs> but anyway, what is an or inorganic being? You're saying, Jeff, shut up and, and get back to the point, you moron. And so I will. I'll get back to the point. So... What is an inorganic being? I pulled up the thing, a text on Google, but I don't want to read that. <clears throat> what an inorganic being is, and I encourage everybody to look it up that has never heard of it, because it's a very fascinating subject. What an inorganic being is, is they are alive. They are... Um, very aware. The one thing that they lack is an organic form. Um, they are otherworldly. Not meaning that they are from different planets. Meaning they are from different dimensions. And there is proof, scientific proof of this. So please look it up. Uh, they are like they are nightmare fuel. They have no organic body like we do or like anything else. So what they do is they can somehow read what our fears are and produce themselves in front of us what our deepest fear or a fear that is present in our brain at that point. Maybe those kids before in their granddad's back bedroom were watching some, who knows, goosebumps or something with a werewolf. And that's what was present in their head. Um, 
when people go out into the woods and they hear that crazy shriek that is not a dog man or a sasquatch but an inorganic being and then it then our brain automatically thinks to bat to the creature um of the the rake this bald creature that that is very very scary but they, they it resembles each other because if you think about this here real quick i'm trying to word this the best i can so when there's identifications of rakes oh god i hate that word when there's identifications of these creatures that look like the rake um they're very similar but they're all different usually there's just different similarities because how I see this creature in my brain is not how you see this creature and how you see the creature is not how Joe Blow sees the creature and this and that. There's maybe different variations like longer fingers, longer, longer legs, longer arms, a more bulbous head. That's why they kind of look different, but they kind of look the same because they feed off of our brain. And that's what an inorganic being is. And I really think that possibly, possibly, that could be, that could have been an inorganic being manifesting itself to what these kids' fear at that time was. I was gliding back and forth. Um, I, I hate using... using fiction um but joss weldon i don't know if you guys know who he is he wrote buffy the vampire slayer he wrote a bunch of other crazy stories comic books and stuff he's a very talented writer very talented guy but there was a buffy the vampire slayer episode where there was these men in suits but they weren't men they resembled the atypical rake but they were in suits they were in business suits and they kind of glided back and forth why because a creature that glides back and forth is creepier than something that walks and that that's my best way of explaining what an in inorganic being is and i encourage everybody to look it up um i i truly encourage everybody to do research on anything anything that you're fascinated with because the research that you do by you sharing that with somebody and them sharing it with somebody you know then we get answers by just you know listening to this YouTube channel, that YouTube channel, reading this book, reading that book, and, you know, that's great and all, but why not research what that person's talking about? Because that is the key. Research is the key that will, and if, think about it, let's say there's a thousand people listening to this upload, and a thousand people do research on something that I said, or anyone said, any upload, those thousand people have now done research on something that someone else had researched, that someone else had researched. So by, by in sense of that, now we're up to 10,000 people's research. It just keeps spreading, if you get what I'm trying to say. Um, and then, then, then we can get to the truth. Because that's how we're gonna get this. We're we're not gonna it's not gonna get handed to us on a platter. I wish it would, but it's not. And it's not gonna get handed to us by pointing fingers at the government. Because all they're gonna do is make that shroud even thicker. But by researching, and then when we have the adequate truth and the adequate proof, then that only breaks the shroud down that puts holes in the shroud and pretty soon that shroud gets too thin and can't cover anymore. And that's how we're gonna get 
the answers that we're looking for. Now I'll shut up and we'll move on. Today's final North Carolina subscriber submission. And I have this gentleman's phone number. I'm going to see if I can get him to come on the show very soon. Um, I've got a couple of his uh, submissions, different states, um, and one of his brother's submissions. And I want to talk to him about the bro- his brother's submission because his brother told me not to share it and I still have it in my files. And I want to kind of get him and his brother together so we can talk about it because it's it's pretty friggin' crazy. But anyway, into this one. Hey Jeff, hope you're doing well. My prayers go out to you. Brother, I had an encounter back in 1988. I was young and dumb and did stupid stuff. I had another guy with me, Kelly. We were both big guys and we thought we were tough. Laugh out loud. After this day, we were both humbled. We were here in North Carolina in a place called Warrior Mountain. A road between Natahala and Franklin, North Carolina. We really wanted to work on this day. Our work van was loaded, and it looked like the van from Scooby-Doo cartoon, but it was white. Now the work we did was rubber roofing. It wasn't hard, but it was hot. We went up Warrior Mountain fast. I was driving and showing off. We were close to the motor blowing. We didn't realize till we had to take off walking. We were five miles away. The nearest house or person. So we let the van roll as far as it would go. That wasn't that far. So we took off walking. Now, what happened next, I think I deserve for blowing my motor in the van. Kelly and me had walked about a mile. We started hearing the brush moving like someone was stomping through it. Kelly said, man, that's a bear and a big bear. All I had was a hunting knife I used for work and a razor knife I gave to Kelly. Plus, I picked up a good solid stick. I bragged that I'd bust its head if it came out on us. I didn't know anything about Dogman, Werewolf, except from the movies. Anyway, Kelly was the first to see the thing. He said it looked like someone's German Shepherd, but it was the biggest damn dog he had ever seen. I said, you saw a bear. He looked at me and grabbed my shirt and said, that's not a bear. He was freaking out bad. I said, a bear would run from us. And what he said next made me scared. Well, why ain't it running off? This thing is big, as big as a young calf and at least 300 pounds, four feet at the shoulders. Now I'm still thinking it's a bear because I hadn't seen it, just heard it and smelled it. I pick up a good-sized rock and threw it where we heard it last. I must have hit it because it let out a yelp like a dog, then a growl that shook me to my bones. You know that fear that's like a burning that starts at the top of your head and goes to the tip of your toes? That's the fear I got. I started to panic because bears don't yelp in pain like a dog. We started walking again and this thing was following us every step. I found a solid stick made out of oak and about eight feet long. I took out my knife and started to sharpen one end. I kept seeing glimpses of this thing moving from tree to tree, then in the bushes when it had to move where we could get a good look at it. I got the stick pretty sharp. I don't know what little good it would do, but I felt better, at least having something. We put up with this dog man following us for about three miles, and we came to where a guy who had moved up here from Florida bought land and started building homes. I had dated his daughter and thought he would give us a ride, but... He wasn't there, only his carpenters, and they weren't going to give us a ride. So we kept walking, but we thought this thing would have been gone. When we got there, it was not. started following us again. The lake was on our left, woods and cliffs to our right. They weren't really cliffs, just wood overhangs with a lot of laurel. Well, we were almost to a place called Griff's, Griff's, Greasy Burgers, and Huge Ones Too. We came to the horseshoe curve in the road, went a short way to the lake where people camped and fished, and there was a small river that ran under the road into the lake, which made for good fishing. And on the right was a trail that went way back up into the mountains. When we got even with the trail, this thing was standing back a ways where a car couldn't see it, and it was standing on its hind legs. I was six too, 
and this thing was at least seven foot or better. It scared me worse than I had ever been at this point. It was standing, growling at us. It was 10 to 15 feet from us. Those teeth looked razor sharp. The eyes were yellow. It was a thing that came out of nightmares. The snout was long. I could see its nose was wet. I don't know why that stood out, but it did. The teeth were two inches long, but the big canines were at least three inches. It was solid black, long hair, just like a black, long-haired German Shepherd. The snout was as big as my forearm. I told Kelly to back up slow. He never said anything, and I looked and he was gone. He left me. I didn't work with him after that. I felt I couldn't trust him. But this dog man kept looking at my stick. Now, not saying this thing told me in my mind to do it, but I just like heard throwing the stick down, so I did it. Looked at me again and dropped to all fours. The front paws had huge claws on them and looked like hands. They were made for slashing. When it was on all fours, it looked like a German Shepherd, but if you took a good look at its size, of its hair was a lot thicker on the upper back like a mane of a lion. It was a beautiful animal until you saw the teeth and then looked into those evil eyes. But its coat was like someone combed it and bathed it. But I know that's not true from the stink the thing let off. I made it to Griff's and Kelly was sitting eating a dang greasy burger. He had one waiting for me like nothing ever happened. I asked him why he left me and he said he was scared. And he thought I was running behind him. He wouldn't talk about it even to this day. I have no doubt this thing could have shredded us like paper, but it didn't, and when I dropped my stick or spear or whatever I had, the dog man turned and walked into the woods. I moved to Georgia, and I had another encounter with another one. I sent you a detailed email of that. I have more. It seems when you've seen one, you see more. I think a lot of times it's because you're looking for them. God bless you and your family, Jeff. God bless all the Dogman family on here. Stay safe. And always go armed with no less than a 44 or 12 gauge. And some special slugs or buckshot or something bigger. There you have it, folks. Today's bonus. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. And I'd like to thank you all for supporting the channel. It is, after all, your support that keeps the channel growing and going. And what gives folks like us a place to share our experiences and theories judgment-free, just simply treated with the respect that we all deserve. Thank you. Everyone, please stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, pets, family, and friends. These creatures are real. They are out there, and they are definitely dangerous. Share this information with the people you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. And until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for the truth, and God bless.